So it's really down to uh, you know the institutions, curatorial teams to actually. You can't rely on the artist to actually find any of the meaning or the social value of the work. Um, things change along the way. So, for instance, we were dealing with lots of uh, issues that now are just commonplace. You know, everybody that has mobile phones or Facebook accounts. You know, these these were quite interesting challenges or fertile areas 10, 15 years ago. Now they're just you know who's interested? No one. Um, but maybe in a hundred years they would be. And that's not down to the art. That shouldn't really be the responsibility of the artist. Um, that's uh, for the community to to interpret that or yeah. find meaning and or re yeah reinterpret it. So as I said, you know, the work is finished when people aren't interested in it anymore. I'd say yeah. that's a good time to stop. Yeah. You know, some artists just carry on and carry on, yeah. like making you know sculptures of themselves for mm -hmm. decades. Great, if people still like it, but I would have done that once, you know. Yeah. It's been really interesting about the, the way in which you work and the points of kind of participation and engagement that your work need. If, if you're saying that it's finished when it's no longer being engaged with, that means that in order to be constituted, you, you, you centralise that engagement. So it's not only you as a performer, it's, it's that engagement that's constituted mm. with your work. Yeah, but it was pointed out to me the other day that you know my work is is 100% predictable. If you look at the first thing that I ever did, it's like, well, what's the logical conclusion for all oh, that, that 20 years' work in between? Oh, it's a status project, make a new identity. It's like, okay, I've been making the same piece mm. over and over again, but badly, and then eventually I get it get it finalised, and that's it. Well, I was interested um, in terms of the biography, how you made that. Sh why that to me that seemed to be maybe a shift is probably the wrong word, but from the work that you made pre-retirement that was the digital art, and then this, this more performative experiential element that had that ground truthing element to it. And obviously the status support shuttles between the two in terms of that mapping of social systems and subjectivities, but yet it still has, it retains that, that kind of performative element that... Well, all that stuff was performative before. You know, what was really going on is we were meeting up and we were having unofficial conferences every month, you know, but to do that you had to present yourself in a certain way. And the next part was the presentation yeah, in a certain yeah, way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's, it's to, you know, because I'm white, working class male, that my only options are to be bad. Yeah, like I tried to talk to you about colour, it's just not going to go down, it's not going to work. I'm you sure know. we could have a wonderful discussion about colours if you if, really if wish. If I was like, you know, from a private school, you know, been to university. We could talk about colours and I could make my whole career out of it. <laughs> but I'm not. And I'm aw well aware of that, you know, you've got some other bad boy artists. Uh, you know, you've got Banksy and you've got Damien Hirst. They realised that early on as well. Got played, played the system to a certain degree, but very smartly. You know, like you never see Banksy or, well, obviously, he's never, people never say, oh, that's an interesting colour red. Like, oh, he broke into there, no one knows who he is. That's all he can do. He does it very well. I think there's an interesting shift, isn't there, in the, <coughs> in the way in which there's the, the married, the, the relationship there, the setting up between form and aesthetic and social consciousness. And, and the way in which you, you, as you pointed out with the, your answer to my question about irrationality, you've taken that playing of the system and that inhabitation and exploration of the system to its own particular form of kind of, of irrational obsession. And I think there's, there's, there's something that made you choose the aesthetics of, of how you did this. You chose the map. Yeah. So there's, def there's something formal going on here. You may, mm. and you, you knew what you were doing mm. when you chose the structure of the map. So I don't know that to, the, the, the way you're setting up the knowledge systems for yourself there, for yourself is necessarily you, you're, you're knowing what you're doing there in the same way you're knowing what you're doing here. So well, I, I want to bring this to High Street. I want everybody to be able to say, oh, you know, hmm, maybe I could go to university. How easy is it to do that? It sounds, you know, it seems like, oh, I could never do that. It's probably 10 or 12 steps away. I'd never be able to do that. I've got other things to do. But you look at the map, there's two steps. Yeah. Each step, you know, takes a week. This is what, you know, this is what I learned with working with homeless people. It's you show them the map, and they, they most of them say, no, I'm quite happy here, quite happy in my position. But others say, oh, three steps, I can have my own place. Five steps, I can have a credit card. I can just be like other people. Maybe I'll do that now. Maybe I'll do it next month. 
you know. So it's that vengeance in the will of the system. Yeah. How do you define love? How do I find love? Well, I don't think you find love. I think you make love. Yeah, it's a thing that two or more people do. You make it. Um, and I think there are very kind of basic steps for doing that. <laughs> you have to be nice to each other for a start. You know, maybe, yeah, I, I, could, I could make a map for... Um, it could be it could be easily made. This is a live this is a live data system, so you can just set, you just say it, make a map for pregnancy. I think in the sexual se has anyone got the map on becoming sexually active? I'm sure that has a relationship with um, pregnancy and love. Probably find some things on there. Um, but obviously, not everything's codified. Not every yeah. human emotion and activity is codified by the state. You know, maybe we should celebrate that. So you're saying you wouldn't map those? Um, well, an another another thing that I found from the uh, studying the system is, um, well, quite surprising to me, but also very obvious. It's one of the the, the negative points about working on something for so long and then producing some truth or some wisdom is everyone's like, oh yeah, of course it is. Why didn't, you know, you worked on that for 10 years, it's obvious. <laughs> and uh, one of them is uh, I've ranked authority. So I've got, I've got all the data about who does what and controls which and who and how. And um, so I've got a rank listing of authority in the UK. So, okay, we do a little hands up test. And then Should we finish, yeah? Okay, who's... Let's see, um, what's the number one authority in the UK? What's the entity that controls your life the most? Come on, take a guess. Anybody that guesses this right, and I haven't already told us to, can have this book. <laughs> yeah? Number one authority in your life. <coughs> in incorrect. <laughs> No. <laughs> very, very close. <laughs> it's your peers and your family. They are the people that you're most afraid of and who control you the most. Yeah? They're common. The, the common understanding, common, not law, that's actually a different te definition, but yeah, commonality. That's what, that's what controls you. That's the authority that by which you, um, which you bow down to all the time. You know, you won't just chuck something on the street because you might be fined by a PCS or whatever they are, 50 pounds. It's because somebody will say, hey, pick that up. Um, second, second most authoritative body in your life. No, who said that? No. All right, we've already had it. It's yourself. You are the person that decides whether you do things or not. You need, often need to... You have to consent. You have to sign saying that you consent. If you don't do that, most things won't happen to you. So how do you feel now? You feel free? <laughs> or you feel oppressed by your friends? <laughs> Just become a loner. You're very free then, yeah? And then, of course, there is things like... Um, further on down, you know, all the other things like the job centre, taxation, police service. The bank. Yeah, or banks. But yeah, it's the, it's the people around you and it's yourself. So for someone like me, starting off very paranoid and, you know, that's my kind of reputation, paranoid hacker, you know, da, 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 da. it's actually an embarrassment to come to the, not quite the end of the project without realisation. It's actually you that controls me. Yeah. On that note, I think. Thank you very much. Can we give um, Peter a little second?